Please be seated. <clears throat> Welcome to another Peaceful Solution Character Education Teacher Certification course. All right. I hope everyone had a great week. End off the weekend. Get ready to. Already in the start of another week here. All right. Anybody look in the mirror and worried about their nose this morning? Huh? <laughs> Anybody worried about their hair or their height this morning? Huh? Anybody just ignore the mirror altogether and hope that it all goes away? <laughs> uh, well, we're talking about acceptance today. And, you know, some of the things that William covered in the last class is, uh, well, pre <laughs> everything that he covered in the last class, as well as the other previous teachers, uh, they're all relevant to every aspect of every person's life, uh, whether you're a 12-year-old uh, uh, in junior high school or whether you're a 50-year-old, you know, um, getting ready to uh, start the second phase of a family and have grandchildren or so forth. Uh, you know, acceptance is something that it sticks with us throughout the course of life. And, and like um, was covered in the previous classes, you know, it's, un it's important that we understand or we accept certain aspects of our life, certain aspects of conditions, certain aspects of circumstances, because not all things do we have complete control over. And the one thing that we need to focus on and the one thing that we're talking about here in this chapter, this is chapter one, we're in chapter one of the acceptance unit, in case you're just joining us here, we're going to be we're going to be starting on page nine today. But the one thing that that the focus is on is accepting me accepting you accepting me accepting you let me go back to the title page here yes chapter one accepting me accepting you and so we're learning here the importance of a what it means to accept the things that we need to focus on accepting and the things that we also need to be mindful of that we should not accept and uh, uh, previous teachers David uh, Chris and William uh, did a great job in covering all those aspects of the various uh, points in regards to you can't disregard everything that we covered in the character unit as far as the foundation that was laid in regards to what is morally correct and what is immorally you know what is immoral not immorally correct <laughs> what is moral and what is immoral okay uh, and that's going to carry with us all throughout the next four units the acceptance is number two here and we have uh, three more to follow in regards to how to put these principles that we're learning uh, into practice because they're all governed by rules. All right, so let's look back here. We'll pick up where William left off. <clears throat> and I want to uh, apologize in advance. I've been dealing with some allergies the last few days and I'm kind of on the tail end of it. So I'm just uh, getting the rest of it out of my lungs. So I got a little coughing I'm doing. It's not tuberculosis or anything like that, so don't be afraid out in the audience. Um, let's look back to L Lesson Plan 1, page F. We're going to go back to Lesson Plan 1, page F. And we're going to go back to Procedure 4. And if you were paying attention last class, William kind of gave us a preview of what we're going to be covering today as we proceed forth in this lesson here on Chapter 1 of the Acceptance Unit. And we'll go ahead and reread that there. It says here on number four, we're on procedure four, tell students that accepting who they are also means learning to be satisfied with their age. And like uh, was covered in the previous class, you don't like your age, uh, well, you don't even have to wait a minute, just wait a second, right? Uh, you're continuously aging every second of the day. Um, it's like when people show a picture and they go, well, this is a picture of me when I was younger. Well, technically, every picture is a picture of you when you were younger because no picture is of you in the future, right? And we're continuously aging. And when, we're, when, a, when a person is in this, this transitory period of life known as adolescence, it, it seems like to them, and I remember when I was uh, you know, a younger person, it seemed like, man, am I going to be stuck at this age forever? You know, now, it wasn't a miserable uh, life that I had growing up, you know, I mean, I had everything that I needed as far as, you know, a, a, a roof over my head and clothes on my back and, and food in my belly. Not always was it the things that I wanted, but I did at least have those things. I, you know, my parents took care of me. 
um, to make sure that I had my needs met. But when you're that age, it seems like you have so much more expendable time to focus on, you know, time going by, right? It's like when a, when a person is uh, sitting around and not doing anything, only thing they can focus on is the seconds of the clock ticking by every single second as a, compared to when you're a little bit older or an adult and you have some responsibilities and you're so preoccupied with getting things done and before you know it, you run out of time. Well, when you're young, it seems like time drags on forever. And, and if you can think back to when you were a lot younger, I mean, <clears throat> the only time it didn't seem like time drug on forever was when you were doing something you really, 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 really enjoyed, okay? Because you were, you think about it, you know, you were so preoccupied with that activity that you weren't even focused on the time. And that's the way it can seem with adolescents, you know, especially if a person is, <clears throat> if a person is not, you know, they haven't learned these characteristics, these traits of, of um, uh, the difference between a positive and the negative character, how to develop a positive character, understanding about influences and, 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 um, and the, the, how they can affect your decision, your thought making process and so forth. You know, they haven't learned these things and it can just make it seem like they're kind of stuck in a lull, stuck in a rut, you know, and that's really not the case because typically uh, most young people, they kind of, even though they might have some hopes, dreams, and aspirations or goals, most of the time their world is focused on the here and now, right? What's right in front of them right this minute. And so, um, you know, it's important as teachers that we remind them that, you know, it might seem like it's taking a long time, but time goes by the same speed for you as it does for everyone else. And the age that you are now, and even the circumstances that you are in now, they will change with time. Uh, even as a, uh, we covered in chapter two of the, um, in the character unit, some uh, young men and, and women, they grow up in homes where uh, there might be abuse, or it might be a lot of dysfunction taking place, and they might seem, they might think in their mind that, that that's a hopeless situation, but it really isn't, and that's up to the teacher to remind them if that is something that's brought to your attention, you know, that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that the one thing that they have control over in that situation is their mind, right? Their thoughts, their, their feelings, their actions, and the development of their character. What they, what they do in every single situation uh, when they might be faced with uh, verbal abuse, uh, you know, when they might be threatened with physical abuse, you know, there are choices. And, of course, that's when you kind of direct them with working with a, <clears throat> a guidance counselor to help them to, to develop um, uh, a plan to deal with those things in a positive way. But what we're laying for them, giving them a foundation of, is how to uh, develop and maintain a positive character because, as was covered um, in the previous classes, you know, you don't want to get into, uh, you know, um, the mindset of retaliation, right? You don't want to get into, uh, you don't want the children or the students to get into the thought process of the only way for me to deal with this uh, problem is to eliminate the person causing the problem because that never truly solves the problem, right? And so the goal here primarily is to focus on the individual, us as the individual, and then as well working with how we can make a difference in society. Well, that goes back to the ripple effect. Well, look at number four again. It says, tell students that accepting who they are also means learning to be satisfied with their age. And then at this time, you want to guide class feedback, <coughs> guide class feedback by asking students some of the things they're allowed to do that a younger sibling is not allowed to do. And, uh, you know, many of us can think of instances, um, and uh, everybody comes from different homes. You might have been the, the oldest, you might have been the youngest, you might have been the middle, who knows. But if you're in the middle, then you had older and younger, right? Um, I was the oldest growing up in, in my family uh, of my siblings, and there were some things that I was allowed to do that my my younger sibling was not allowed to do, you know, and I remember those things and some of those things I, I valued and I treasured because they tended to, uh, uh, you know, get in a little bit more trouble and that took away some of their rewards. I was at least old enough to know that if you didn't get in trouble, then you could have more 
rewards or um, privileges given to you. Um, but, you know, some of the things might be, like was covered last class, staying up a little bit later. You know, if you have a, uh, a bedtime curfew of uh, 10 o'clock or 9.30, well, it might be extended to uh, 10 o'clock or 10.30, right? I uh, might be able to uh, stay outside a little bit longer or maybe go down the street, you know, a couple houses down, ride your bike down there to, to see your friend or, to, you know, uh, you know, go, go bike riding with them or maybe go bike riding on a trail or something like that or whatever the case might be. There might be some some responsibilities that a parent might give a child that they might really want to do. It might be allowing them to, to cut the grass by themselves without, you know, an adult there pushing the lawnmower with them if they're old enough. Um, by this age, you know, 11 to 13, they should be old enough to push a lawnmower by themselves. But but you want to make sure that they that they're understanding of the rules and being responsible about those things. So it's not always necessarily a uh, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a thing like a, a play thing. It could be actually doing a job that they really enjoy doing, right? Um, and so you can ask them that to get a little bit of feedback from them uh, as an older sibling, some of the things that a younger sibling is not allowed to do. And then you can ask, what are some of the things <clears throat> that an old older sibling can do that they cannot? Uh, and sometimes you might get a little bit of a... Uh, uh, statements given in a little jealousy there <laughs> you know sometimes the younger siblings they, they think it's not fair because the older sibling gets to do something and well we're gonna see here a little bit um, why it's um, allowed that certain things are given based on age at, at times certain times in life and then it says here what are some things Oh, I read that part stress that as they grow they will have limitations okay and we're gonna cover that and a definition here pretty soon. They will have limitations <coughs> and privileges that are age appropriate, right? So, you know, the the father might allow the 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 thirteen year old son to to steer the boat on the lake, you know, because they're going to go fishing. But he might not allow the four year old to steer the boat on the lake while they're gonna go fishing, especially if it's a motorboat, because you might crank that throttle and whip everybody around in there, you know, not knowing how to properly, you know, handle the controls and so forth. So certain things are age appropriate. It's not because a, a parent is not being fair, and you might have to stress this to the younger um, uh, children who are who are younger siblings, you know, that, you know, it's not necessarily something of, of unfairness. It's just uh, certain things that a person has to be old enough or strong enough or uh, knowledgeable enough to carry out that responsibility. Have students read and discuss the section entitled, Hey, You're Not Finished Growing Yet, found on page nine in their handbooks. Okay, and so we're, let's, let's go over to there and then we'll come back to that second portion of that procedure there in a little bit. Page nine <clears throat> in your handbook under, hey, you're not finished growing yet. And if you look at the top box there, <clears throat> uh, in the quote there says, so you don't like your age? Well, wait, just wait a while. That's the nice thing about a person's age. It never stays the same, okay? And like, like a William was covering last class, it seems like nobody is satisfied with their age. You know, when you're young, I remember when I was younger and I was kind of in my early teenage years, I was thinking, you know, man, I can't wait till I can, you know, get my learner's permit. You know, I can't wait till I turn 15 so I can get my learner's permit. Now I can't wait till I get my driver's license. You know, then I, now I can't wait till I can drive without somebody being with me, an adult with me all the time. You know, then it was, oh, I can't wait till I'm 18 and I can do certain things. Then you realize, oh, wait, there's still stuff I can't do yet. Oh, I can't wait till I'm 21. You know, and then you're like, well, wait, I want to be president. Oh, I can't wait till I'm 35. You know, wait, I want to collect Social Security. Oh, I can't, you know. <laughs> so there's always another stepping point or age or something that you want to get to until, like, you know, was said, you get a little bit older and you start thinking, man, you know, it sure was a lot easier when I was a teenager or it sure was a lot easier when I was living at home. I sometimes look at my, my three-year-old toddler and I think, man, this is the easiest you have it now, man. Just running around, people feed you, you know, change you and everything. <laughs> you know, you kind of have the easiest that you're ever going to have it in life. But, you know, as we grow, uh, our minds grow, we get more mature, and we have more responsibilities that are placed on us. And then we also uh, have the, the ability to 
I guess uh, the word would be um, be conscientious of, you know, where we were when we were a lot younger. A lot of times when we get older, we realize, boy, we were really pretty foolish and we did a lot of foolish things when we were children that we would that we could have done them, uh, not done those things or done them a little bit differently uh, to give us a better start in life. And well, that's the whole thing behind what the peaceful solution is is there for is to be able to give a person uh, a beneficial start in life give them a the right footing on this path that as we covered in the first chapter of the character unit uh, the road less traveled now that doesn't mean that just because you didn't have this peaceful solution character education program when you were a preteen or a teenager or a young adult that you can't learn something new <clears throat> that you can't improve your character, right? That you can't change who you are on the inside because that's exactly what you're going to be able to do. And why? Because you're going to be fed, the student, every single one of us, are fed with the knowledge that gives us the power to bring about the change that will enable us to be a benefit to ourselves, others, and society as a whole. <clears throat> so let's look at that first paragraph there. On chapter uh, page 9, we're in chapter 1. It says, Accepting yourself means accepting the age and the limitations that go with it. All right, and like we covered here just before, you know, when you're a certain age, there are certain things that you have to do, right? Uh, in most schools, in most places in the United States, you know, it's a requirement that, you know, you be... Uh, schools in some way. Either you attend a public school or private school, or you can be homeschooled, right? But the, the, the city or the state or the country requires that a young person requires some type of formal education, okay? And as was covered in the previous classes, all the curricula that is normally given in schools, reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, social studies and history and science, those things are very, 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 very beneficial. But sadly, they still leave the individual or the student ill-equipped to face life's moral challenges, right? They might be able to solve a calculus problem, or they might be able to tell you who was the, you know, president of this country at, and, and this year, but it doesn't give them the strength and the decision-making capacity to make an honest choice. Right? It doesn't help them to understand why it's important to be a responsible person or why they should be patient in the face of someone antagonize them or why they should be tolerant uh, when they're faced with intolerance pointed at their direction. Well, it says here, because you are not yet an adult, you are limited in the choices you are allowed to make. And when you think about that word limitations, <clears throat> accepting yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, means accepting the age and the limitations that go with it. And when you think of the word limitations, um, uh, think of uh, boundaries or rules. Um, in, fa in fact, the word limitation means a limiting rule or circumstance. It also means a restriction, okay? A limiting rule or circumstance. Remember what we covered in the first chapter of the character unit that another word for rules are morals morals okay and so people think of rules and they instantly think of this last word here given in this definition restrictions oh boy rules I can't do anything now there's always rules well you know it's a, a, a fact of life that there are always going to be rules you know even when a child leaves high school and they graduate and they think well you know now I'm an adult I can go to college or I can take a gap year or I can go to work or whatever you know I can kinda of do whatever I want to do no there's always rules that they're gonna to have to follow and for them to have this foundation laid <coughs> and accept even the fact that there are rules and why there are rules in place that'll help them to be a um, what's the word um, um, it's a, it's a citizen, but the, uh, a great citizen, right? 
because the great citizen is one who follows the rules, right? one who doesn't go out of their way to break the rules, who encourages others to keep the rules and so forth. But these rules um, are there, remember, they're there to keep us safe. They're there to instill order uh, within society. Um, uh, even the rules that, that when you get a job uh, and you, for instance, they might go into a particular trade of uh, plumbing or carpentry or electrical or, um, you know, heating and cooling or any of those things, uh, there are rules that have to be followed. And the trades have gone through extensive years of knowledge and research to put certain rules in place, especially when it comes to buildings, because you're dealing with the structure and the health and safety of the occupants of that building, right? Uh, you know, we just recently saw not that long ago a, uh, a building that, an apartment, a condominium in fact, beachside condominium that collapsed in New, uh, New York, Florida here just a few days ago. Now, you know, it's still under investigation um, as to why, why that took place, uh, but, but that's a part of the reason why it's important that rules be followed. There's always going to be rules, and that's something that we want to kind of gently express to the, to the students, you know, the, to remind them that there is absolutely nothing wrong with rules. And the sooner they can get that fact in their minds, the, the easier it will be for them to adapt to rules that govern every aspect of life. In other words, they're not going to fight against it. They're not going to have, they're not going to resist. All right, so for your own safety, as well as your physical and intellectual growth, your parents, and notice here teachers, and you know you can mark, circle, and underline that because you're training to be teachers, <coughs> and other authority figures, notice here, instruct, guide, and monitor, monitor how you are influenced. Okay, now this is something that it's, you know, if you really read this and pay attention to this, this is showing someone who has a parent, um, a teacher, or any other authority figure, you know, they kind of are, they're kind of sticking their nose kind of in your life, so to speak, a child's life, right? Uh, because a child is not old enough to, to be on their own, right? They're not old enough to make every single decision. In fact, if a child is sent to the hospital or an emergency room, the majority of the time, unless it's, unless it's a life or death emergency, most doctors won't perform any surgery or give any medicine, administer, administer any medicine to that child without the parent or guardian's consent. Okay, so a, a child is under the, the, um, the guardianship uh, or the direction of their parents for a period of time. And that's something that, you know, I think most people generally understand and accept. Uh, until there's something that they want to do that their parents restricting them for, um, then they want to go and divorce their parents, you know, or be um, uh, emancipated, right? They want to be emancipated. Some courts you can go and a child can be emancipated uh, from being under the legal authority of their parent. Uh, in fact, I believe it's um, in the state of Texas here, it is, um, eight, in most states, it is 18 uh, years old, you're under the, the the parent has legal authority of their children, unless of course they're legally emancipated by a court, or the parents sign off for them getting married at a younger age. All right. So here, notice here, parents, teachers, or authority figure, uh, other authority figures, instruct, guide, and monitor how you are influenced, the decisions you make. Remember, the decisions you make, they start with your thoughts, right? <clears throat> and one of the biggest things that can contribute to that thought process are your influences, right? And some of the things that can be of a great influencing factor to you are family values. Uh, don't forget your environment, okay? Uh, don't forget your friends and the people that you associate with. You know, all those things and many more are influences that will lead a, a person, a child, to the point where they'll have to make a decision on something, okay? Because they, they think about a particular thing that they saw, or they heard, um, or they experienced, and, you know, they like that, or they didn't like something, and now they want to respond in some type of way, and so then they act on it. And that leads us to the next point here. Um, how you're influenced, the decisions you make, 
and how you conduct yourself. And so we're seeing here some of the, the, the factors in um, self-control here, thoughts and actions. And so it is kind of necessary at a certain point for a, a parent to kind of guide the reins, so to speak, uh, on their child until they can develop enough maturity to practice self-control, all right? So until there is self-control, there is a little external control that is brought into uh, the child's life by the parents, you know, by the teachers. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with a, a teacher uh, controlling the classroom for the purpose of creating a healthy educational environment, right? You know, if a teacher says, hey, everyone settle down, sit down in your seats and be quiet so we can all learn, you know, a student doesn't have the right to say, you don't control me. I can do whatever I want to do. No, the rules of the classroom is you sit down quietly and pay attention, okay? And there are rules set in place in the classroom for that very thing, for, for the, uh, the fact that there needs to be a healthy learning environment. Remember, it is their responsibility to help you grow into the best person you can be, okay? Uh, that is the parents, the teachers, or other authority figures. <clears throat> Look back at that second paragraph there. It says, because you are not yet an adult, you are limited to the choices you are allowed to make. And this is a point here that I wanted to, I was thinking about this when I was going over the lesson because when you, sometimes young people think, you know, because occasionally they've been in trouble, you know, with law a few times, and, you know, they've kind of been in and out of detention centers and, um, you know, had warnings and things like that. The police visit their parents, and uh, they think that their age kind of makes them a little bit invincible to certain consequences in life. And that's not really true, you know. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of um, uh, the, the phrase, tried as an adult, tried as an adult. And um, <clears throat> sometimes, and this is something you can share with them, you know, sometimes when a child, and generally speaking, a child is someone considered by most states' um, books a person under 18 years of age, okay? Um, really, at 18, you're still a child, <laughs> I mean, uh, but, um, but you're legally able to do certain things and you're legally considered uh, probably like the first stage of an adult before 21. Um, but certain crimes can be committed and the jury the courts can deem you uh suitable to be sentenced as an adult in other words you're not going to get a light slap on the hand you know in a few months in in juvenile uh hall and uh then let go no they'll try you as an adult and you'll receive an adult sentence in fact in the state of texas here um i believe it's uh what is it, uh, a 15 to 17 year old in the state of Texas for second and third degree or a state jail felony can be tried as an adult. And in Texas, once you're tried as an adult, everything that follows until you're 18, you're considered an adult. You know, so it's not like, well, you were tried at 15, well, now if something else comes up, well, you know, you're, you're only 16. No, you're gonna be considered an adult in that judicial system. So. It's, it's important to kind of remind them, you know, that they need to be very careful of, of the influences that they allow themselves to be around because they can be involved in some pretty serious things that can put them on the wrong side of the law. Whether they're tried as an adult or tried as a juvenile, either way, they don't want to be in the judicial system in that regards because when you're there for that, it's a consequence of making a bad choice. So we want to help them to prevent and to recognize those things before they make a bad choice so that they don't make one. All right, so it says here, um, I wanted to read something else here. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I meant to read a definition here on this um, parents, teachers, and other authority figures. It says they instruct, guide, and monitor. All right, and uh, that word monitor, <clears throat> it means to observe and check the progress or quality of something or someone over a period of time, okay? To observe <clears throat> and, a, and a check the progress or quality 
of something over a period of time. Uh, and that time for most people is from birth, birth until the age of 18 or 21 or whenever they move out of their parents' house. Sadly, sometimes not until they're like 40 something. But, um, but the parents continually do that to their children. And sometimes children get agitated by it. You know, oh, mom, dad, why do you keep checking on me? You know, no, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm 12 now. I'm like, oh, excuse me. You know, <laughs> you know, you've got all the experience in life. You know, they, they, they think in their mind, you know, uh, because, especially in today's day and age. And that's something that we have to keep into consideration. You know, when these books were written in the <coughs> mid, late 90s and early 2000s, it's a lot different world than what we have now you know we're almost 20 years down the road and technology has just just uh bloomed out of control so to speak uh you know uh where our children are um bombarded with all sorts of influences and all sorts of tools that enable them to be influenced uh by negative influences pretty much 24 hours a day seven days a week you know i think a lot of you as as i can uh, remember after about 11, 11.30, maybe 12 or 1 o'clock, the three channels that I had, remember growing up, 3, 5, and 8, they went to static. They went to bars, you know? They went to color bars, and that was it. There was nothing else to watch. You know, you had to pull out the funnies on the newspaper and read them again if you wanted to do something, you know? But, but that was pretty much it. Now, television is 24 hours a day, right? And children don't even have to turn on a television. They can just pick up their phone and, and watch all these things streaming continuously. Okay? Uh, and so this is why it's even more so important that parents and teachers monitor the, uh, the progress or the quality of their child's character. And that's what we're dealing with here, their character. Because their behavior is a reflection of their character. And the other things that, that are factors that lead into the development of that character. So even though you might be instructed on what time you should come home, we're continuing in that first paragraph there, <clears throat> what time you should come home, who you should be friends with, what time you should go to sleep, and even what you should eat, keep in mind that it really is for your benefit. You know, and, and that's kind of the challenge there in, in working with a young person. It's hard to sometimes get them to see, you know, the instructions that they are given, how it's going to benefit them in the end. I remember growing up and not always seeing or understanding the instructions or the restrictions that my parents placed upon me when I was growing up and when I asked to do something. Right, that later on in life, I understood it. You know, as I became an adult, I understood how, you know, they kind of had that foresight to see that. Well, when you associate or you allow yourself to to be around, uh, keep company with people who, you know, might not always be on the up and up. You know, you could find yourself in a situation where it's guilt by association. You know, and as parents <coughs> and teachers, we want the best for our children and students. Right? We don't want them to have to suffer the consequence to learn the lesson. Right? We want to teach them to be able to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong, what's beneficial and what's harmful, what's positive and what's negative. And hopefully they will develop the value in their own mind and heart to go, you know, I remember what was taught in class at the Peaceful Solution, or I remember what my parents were teaching me when we sat down and read the Peaceful Solution, or, or they reminded me before I left, you know, you know, not to just hop in any person's car, you know, not to not to go drinking and driving, not to try some substance that you don't know what it is, not to put anything in your body or or even on your body. There are some drugs that you can just touch. I think fentanyl is one of them, you know, that you can just touch and it'll absorb into the skin and you can start suffering immediately. You know, uh, some people go into immediate cardiac arrest just by getting a little bit of powder or something on their skin. Uh, I think it's a synthetic opioid. Uh, that it can absorb through the skin and it can it can kill people, right? And so it's important to try to uh, help them to understand, and that can be a challenge, that, that the reason that they're being instructed, the reason that they are being monitored, the reason that they're being guided is because we want to help keep them safe, right? We want to give them uh, 
for lack of a better word, a, a fighting opportunity uh, or the wisdom, the knowledge, the power to be able to make sound moral choices. All right, let's look at the next paragraph there. We're on uh, page nine in chapter one of the um, acceptance unit. We're looking at the second paragraph. Now, it's interesting because, <coughs> excuse me, from this point on, I believe this uh, next word here, humble, humble or humility, I believe is mentioned at least four or five times, you know, in the next two paragraphs, the next two paragraphs. And so it's, it's obviously very important that in accepting our age and the limitations that come with our age, it's stressing that it's really, really important to have this character trait of humility. And it says here, a humble, thankful attitude. Now, those two, those two positive character traits, you can jot down for your note there, is um, page 14 and 15, and I believe they consecutively go right with one another, behind one another, in the character unit in chapter 1. You know, hum humble, not being proud or arrogant. Uh, you know, thankful, being appreciative of the things and the benefits that you have. Uh, you know, a humble person is also a person who doesn't mind being trained. They don't mind being guided or corrected, right? Uh, they realize that they don't know it all. There is more that they can learn, right? A thankful person is also, uh, you know, they're, they're appreciative. They, they enjoy the things that, that life has to offer. They, they're thankful for the things that they do have in life instead of always focusing on the things that they don't have in life. You know, um, it's part of uh, the two kind of go hand in hand thankfulness and optimism okay because it's easy to only focus and look at well I don't have this you know I I have a house I live in a house but I don't live in a, a mansion you know I have shoes but I don't have the latest shoes well a thankful person is appreciative of the fact that they do have shoes you know that they do have, have a home <coughs> have a home to go to or they do have food in their refrigerator or whatever the case might be there are many things if you sit down and make a list of them and really stop and think about it, you know, and, and you can do this as an activity with your students. There are many things that a person has to be thankful about if they really stop and think about what they have to be thankful about and not worry about all those other aspects, things that they don't have. Sometimes not having certain things you really should be thankful about too, you know, because they can do more harm than benefit. Just look at a lot of these people who have, uh, kind of gone overnight from rags to riches, uh, become instant millionaires by winning the lottery, and they've gone back, you know, five or nine years later, and they've done interviews with them, and a, lot, a great majority of, of them have said, I wish I would have never won the lottery. You know, I'm worse off now than I was before I was a millionaire. You know, somebody, you think, how can a person be worse off, you know, after winning five or $20 million, you know, than they, than they were beforehand. Well, a lot of it goes back to character. A lot of it goes back to education. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a lottery. It could be, you know, starting a, a, a career or a job, you know, and having great success with that. I've seen people have great success in, in businesses and it grows faster than they can kind of keep control over and they just have money flowing in left and right. They don't even know what to do with it, you know, and they're just kind of just doing all kinds of crazy stuff and uh, you know mismanagement creates a, causes a lot of downfall in a lot of companies well if they would go back and attend a workshop uh, you know, education moral excellence in the workplace they would probably be able to manage that a little bit better alright so uh, let's look here on the second paragraph a humble thankful attitude leaves no cause for conflict now this does not mean that a person who has a humble or a thankful attitude won't ever be involved in the conflict. It just means that there is no cause from the individual, you know, that's putting this, that the individual that has a humble, thankful attitude is not going to cause a conflict. Okay, why? Because they're going to be humble. You know, even if they think they're right in the situation, they're going to take the humble approach and bring about a peaceful solution. Just because you're right doesn't mean you have to express to the other person in no uncertain terms that you're right and they're wrong. A humble person will go, you know what, not necessarily out loud, but I can see that this is causing a conflict. What is it that I need to do to bring about a peaceful solution? Remember, it takes 
One fool to start an argument, two fools to keep it going, right? So in some cases, it's just necessary to step away. You know, you know, you know what? I can see that this is creating a conflict. How about we just take a break from this and collect our thoughts and come back a little bit later and try to work this out peacefully. Sometimes that's all that's needed, right? And when people calm down and the emotions are, are de-escalated, then you can come back with a clear, clear head and work out the problem. Sometimes you might need a third party there to mediate. But um, it says, without a humble attitude, there's the, the second humble there, uh, being instructed on what you should and should not do can seem frustrating. Why? Because you want to be in control of everything. The child wants to be in control of everything. They don't want the parent to tell them or the teacher to tell them what they should do and how they should do it. And again, remember, parents and teachers aren't doing these things to be overburdening, you know, overburdensome to the child or the student. They're not doing it to micromanage. They're just doing it to give you the right to give you the right footing, to give you the instructions, to give you the proper resources that you need to make the right choice. And then once they see that, it's kind of like when you're teaching a child how to ride a bike. We've mentioned that before, right? And they might think that they can do it, and the minute you let go, they fall down. So as a parent, not wanting them to get hurt, you hold on to the seat a little bit longer. And you know, I got it, I got it, Dad, and you hold on to the seat for a little bit longer. When you think they have it, then you let go, okay? And as a teacher, you're not really letting go, but you're giving them a little bit more freedom, a little bit more responsibility to make more uh, choices on their own as they get older, not only in years, but in maturity. Many teens have a difficult time maintaining positive relationships with those in authority because, notice here, they have opposing views of what is fair. And, 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 you know, well, let's finish reading here. Here's the bottom line. Even though you may not like a decision that your parents or other authority figures have made for your benefit that you think is unfair, you must still be respectful and obey. All right? Going back to the foundation of what we've learned. Okay? Is it doing harm? to ourselves or others? Is it encouraging or directing us to break the rules? Okay, no, we'll follow the instructions. And again, you can write for your notes there, um, uh, chapter two, chapter two of the character unit when it comes to, um, talks about um, some of the aspects of dysfunctionality in the family and, and uh, you know tells the students about certain things that they should not do and should not keep a secret even if it's a parent or <clears throat> any other authority figure that's trying to get them to do it because there are some things that you know sometimes parents are who are not educated and you know who don't have prop, proper sound morals uh, you know might try to do and get their child to do that's immoral well in those situations you don't you, know, you don't have to break the rules. You know, you don't have to uh, allow yourself to be abused in certain things. You know, you should or in anything. You know, go to a trusted adult. Get with the guidance counselor. You know, talk to a, another trusted family member that can help you. You know, never should you be allow yourself to be directed or encouraged to break the rules. Okay, remember what we just covered here at the beginning of this. The rules are there for our safety, our safety and our well-being. All right, it says, if you have ever instructed a younger sibling to do something, so we're switching the seats here and going from the person receiving the instruction to the person giving the instruction, you know, so giving the student two different points of view here. If you have ever instructed a younger sibling to do something for his or her benefit and he or she refused, then you know how parents or other authority figures feel when they are disobeyed. And, and a lot of times I, I've seen where, uh, you know, a lot of older children, they, it kind of clicks to some degree when they're trying to get their younger sibling to do something, right? They're trying to get them to quit running around or quit, quit touching their belongings, you know, put that back, and they're not listening to them, you know, and then they can kind of get an idea if the parent reminds them or if they just, you know, think back to when they were acting that way towards their parents, oh, okay. That must be how I look to mom or dad, right? 
you know, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like when people touch my belongings. I don't like when people don't follow my instructions. I should be more mindful when I'm giving instructions, right? And, you know, that's a, that's a sign of growth. You know, that's a sign of maturity in, the, in that individual. Um, sometimes they, they kind of need that, that younger sibling to see that, to see how the parents feel when they're instructing them. Um, keep in mind that someday you might be a parent. How would you want to be treated when you are trying to do your best, notice here, to protect, guide, feed, and train your child, okay? Um, and so, you know, just reiterating to that uh, in their minds that <clears throat> keeping that feeling in their, their minds or their, or their thoughts, and, it, and it, you know, it wouldn't even have to be a sibling, a younger sibling. It could just be they could be uh, given a class project where they're, in charge of a group of people and you've ever get into, gotten a group of young people together man it's like well the teacher's not there well you know it's just kind of sometimes chaos <laughs> you know everybody's got to give their uh, opinions or throwing out all types of crazy hypothetical you know questions or scenarios and it can get a little bit frustrating right and so it gives them an opportunity to see from a parent or teacher standpoint what that parent or teacher might be going through all right so let's look at the last paragraph says the moral character trait of humility will help you accept instructions and guidance with a positive, respectful attitude. Instead of arguing, becoming angry, or refusing to obey. A humble person is willing to learn, be taught, and follow directions. So you can actually mark that there as another, <coughs> or as a supplement to the the, the definition of the word humble, <clears throat> even though this isn't specifically giving you, you know, a bold definition, but that goes right along with it. A humble person is willing to learn, be taught, and follow instructions or directions. So when you are asked to have a humble attitude, you, in essence, um, in essence, you are being encouraged to be willing and open to improve yourself. Always know that your actions can be better and your thought process can be improved. The process of learning moral conduct never ends. <coughs> Excuse me. And like uh, I believe it was Chris that covered in the previous class, you know, when do you finally finish maturing? You know, when do you finally finish aging? We never do. I kind of I kind of compared uh uh, some of my uh, older, um, trying to carefully choose my words, <laughs> I, I kind of uh, compare some of the older generation to not, I don't really call them old people. You know, I say they, you know, they age like fine wine, right? Um, and, and when you think about wine, wine, I don't think ever really stops aging. You know, it continues to age. And some of the you know, the, these archaeological digs, they have found wine that was several hundred or some, sometimes even several thousand years old, you know, and it was still uh, drinkable because it just continues to get better with age, kind of like cheese, right? It gets better when not everybody likes cheese, you know. Uh, it, gets, it gets better with age, and that's the way it is with our character. You know, the more we rehearse this, William said, you know, in last class, you know, it's not like you can just read the acceptance unit. Oh, I've read the acceptance unit. I've got it all down packed now, right? No, you have to go back and rehearse these things over and over and over and again. And the more you, you value this information, the more you find yourself going back to and, and finding solutions when you're faced with a conflict, you know, and what did the peaceful solution say about that? Now, I remember it saying something. I remember giving a scenario about something similar to this before in uh, chapter such and such of the character unit or of the self-control unit. And you'll find yourself going back and referencing that uh, because it's a great source of knowledge, right? It's a tool. Remember, the, the character education is a tool that, you know, well, one of these things that we take along with us in that, that big suitcase, remember, uh, uh, <coughs> that we take with us in life, <coughs> We want to take tools with us to, to maintain our healthy character, right? You know, we never want it to ever break down, right? Uh, the only way it'll break down is if we stop 
learning and practicing the things that, we're le- that we've been uh, taught in the peaceful solution. But we want to maintain it because, you know, things do wear and we kind of sometimes forget things. So we want to go back and refresh our minds from time to time. And this is why it's important, you know, eventually it'll get to the point where, you know, this will be valued enough that parents will start uh, learning it themselves and teaching it to their, their, their children even uh, before they're born and then carrying that on throughout uh, their, their um, formative years into adulthood. And eventually we'll see a change in society. It's going to take some work, but it's possible. <clears throat> So it says, when you're asked to have a humble attitude, in essence, you are being encouraged to be willing and open to improve yourself and always, always know that your actions can be better and your thought process improved. The process of learning moral conduct never ends. There is always room for improvement, even if you reach 100 years. Even if you reach 1,000 years, there's always room for improvement, right? There's always things that we can do to improve our character to be more of a benefit uh, not only to ourselves but to others as well. Let's look back to uh, lesson plan one, (coughs) page F. (coughs) Lesson plan one, page F. And let's go back to that second paragraph there in uh, procedure four. It says, explain that although there are circumstances beyond their control, uh, they can control their attitude and outlook on life. Stress that how they interpret and perceive their circumstances can cause dissatisfaction and resentment. And that that word there, interpret, uh, it means to conceive, uh, to conceive in the mind. Let me see here. Yeah, to conceive. The word conceive means to form or or devise a plan or idea in the mind, uh, to conceive in the light of individual belief, judgment, or circumstances. So to to have a thought or an idea about something based on your own individual belief, judgment, or circumstance. Another word um, or a synonym for that word interpret is construe. Right, like when someone tells you something, or you know, you've heard the the statement, you know, you you construed that in your own mind. You know, you kind of interpreted that. You know, the parent says, well, you know, um, you know, in order to go outside, you know, your room has to be the room has to be in order. You know, well, the child interpreted that. Well, let's just throw everything into the closet, and it, the parent can't see toys all over the floor or clothes all over the floor, so my room's in order. Right, and so. Um, it's, it's important that they understand that they're going to interpret and they're going to perceive their circumstances based on certain things that they already have in their mind, right? Their belief systems, their judgments, and their circumstances. And also perceive, that word perceive means to become aware or conscious of something. Come to realize or understand. It also means interpret or look on someone or something in a particular way. Um, so stress that how they perceive, interpret and perceive their circumstances can cause dissatisfaction or resentment. In other words, if they feel like they're being uh, treated unfairly by their parents or by their teacher, you know, then they might respond in a way that expresses their dissatisfaction or resentment. Okay, Explain that adolescence is a time of rapid physical and mental change. Many young adults feel uncomfortable with these changes. They might begin to devalue themselves and suffer bouts of depression. And William gave the the definition of the uh, uh, depression last class um, um, about the extreme long sadness that a person goes through, not just sadness itself, but extreme long or prolonged sadness. Um, It says they may begin to devalue themselves and suffer bouts of depression, stress that focusing on what they can control and accepting themselves as unique individuals will enable them to develop their potential, okay? The potential to become the very best that they can become, to become, to develop the, the, the highest moral character that they can develop. And sadly, in society right now, that's not really a goal. 
you know, when you, you hear young people, um, you know, getting together in a group, you might hear, oh, wow, man, those are nice shoes. Are those the latest, you know, blah, blah, blahs? You know, that's a really neat outfit. Oh, man, man, who, who did your hair? You know, who, who cut your hair? What barbershop you go to? Don't ever go, man, is that, is that responsibility I'm sensing in you right now? Yeah, you don't ever hear that, you know? Man, you, you seem like you were really honest in that class yesterday. You know, you picked that up and you gave that back to that person. Nobody even seen it fall on the ground. I saw it, but nobody else did. You know what I mean? They don't, they don't talk about those things. They're not really encouraged to talk about those things in general in life, you know? But um, it's because it's not stress. It's not the focus. Sadly, you know, like we covered at the very beginning of this, the focus is on the external. You know, it's, it's not on the internal. It's not on the character of the individual. And, you know, I was looking um, just real quick before we close out here. <coughs> Because it was talked about um, um, a little bit in the last two classes, and I was wondering what was it like for, you know, what the statistics are for a lot of young people in regards to dealing with how they feel they look to other people. And plastic surgery is a way that a lot of people start to deal with things um, or try to deal with things that they're not satisfied with in regards to their own physical appearance. But it says here, and this was. Um, this was from 2017, um, or 2018, I'm sorry, published 2018. It says, more than 200,000 teens had plastic surgery last year, and social media had a lot to do with it. That's 200,000 teens. It says here, I won't read the whole thing. It says, teens are also showing an increased interest in Botox and other injectables. Now, these are teens, you know, ages, you know, 13, 12, 13 through, through 17 years old. Doctors attribute this to young people scrolling through the Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter feeds of celebrities with augmented cheeks and lips. Doctors say this phenomena is one of many plastic surgery trends fueled by social media. So remember what we talked about, what a parent is there to do to help to govern your influence you know what you're influenced by and they might not want you watching things with a lot of this doctored you know garbage in your mind creates garbage out they don't want you watching these things because they know that they're powerful influences and if they're you know kind of opposing you as a parent and trying to lead and guide them then parents know that if a child if a child's mind is determined to do something and you won't allow them to do it they'll try to find a way to get it done so it's best to stop it at the head, you know, to prevent them from seeing certain of these things, at least while they're under your care, and then instill within them the value of appreciating themselves for who they are on the inside and working on developing their positive character and, and everything outside. You know, they, they say, you know, beauty is skin deep. Um, and I've found in life that, you know, uh, <laughs> some of the most beautiful people, I guess for lack of better words, that I've interacted with, it was it was because of their character you know it was because of who they were and how they presented themselves not because of how they looked you know I didn't care about how they looked but it was because of who they were you know and that's true beauty and that's and that's important to express that to young men and women especially to the young women there they seem to be pretty vulnerable to this young men too uh, but a lot with young because this article shows here that it's a lot of the young girls that are that are doing these things these augmentations and this uh, plastic surgery <clears throat> that they shouldn't change who they are on the outside just to fit in. You know, focus on changing on who, th who they are on the inside and strengthening the positive attributes and characteristics of who they are on the inside because that is what really is going to make them a great person. That is what's really going to make them a beautiful person. But um, it says here, I guess I'm going to kind of finish off what William left off last time. Many young adults feel uncomfortable with these changes and they may begin to devalue themselves and suffer bouts of depression. Stress that focusing on what they can control and accepting themselves as unique individuals will enable them to develop their potential. And so next class, we're going to pick up on page 10 with uh, uh, the reading of the cold hard facts and knowledge is power, which is on page 10 and 11. And, uh, and students will be reminded that by learning the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, they can gain knowledge to help them develop their full potential. And sometimes it takes someone outside looking in to see 
the potential of what a person can become and encourage and motivate them in the right direction so that they can reach that full potential, giving them the proper tools as well. And that's what we're finding as we go through this Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. So I do thank you all for joining us. Uh, next class will be uh, Sunday, 6, uh, I'm sorry, Wednesday, Wednesday, today Sunday, uh, Wednesday, 6.30, 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Have a great evening.